thank you guys for coming out. I mean, this is, this is important to our company, uh, important to the community. Uh, it's a passion that we all have here at Busy Bee. You know, all of us enjoy working with the plants and Mother Nature. And without you guys, this really doesn't work. So I'm happy to do classes, especially when I get a turnout like this. So this is great. And uh, I thank you for sharing your time with us uh, today. Uh, I'm going to try and move through this seminar as quickly as possible because it is Mother's Day weekend. Some of you guys have events, it's hot out, and it's my day off. <laughs> so, um, obviously we're going to do butterfly gardening, but before we get started, just kind of introduce myself and then some of the specials we got going on. My name's Danny. I've been with Busy Bee for 16 years. Uh, I enjoy working for them. They're great owners, great people. We have an awesome staff. Uh, love every one of them and a wonderful clientele. So uh, I'm here to stay. So if you guys ever have questions, have any issues in the garden, come in and see us. We'll get you the answers if we don't have them right off the top of our heads. And uh, we want to make you successful. So we're going to start getting into butterflies. Uh, I just put in a butterfly garden in my own yard last year. We played with them here in the, in the yard uh, out back. Usually I get to give you a tour through the butterfly garden, but uh, we're not going to do it today because it's such a big crowd um, and it's really not open to the public. It was more of uh, the owners putting it back there for their own enjoyment and uh, through the years the employees and some customers have also been able to uh, sneak back there and take a little quick peek um, so if you're ever interested you know sometimes I can steal your caterpillars out back of there uh, especially if you like the Dutchman's pipe vine swallowtail we usually get loads of those so basically I'm gonna run through the uh, butterflies a little bit of information about them and then we're gonna cycle through a bunch of plants that they love so you can build your garden so starting out your garden, we have to decide what's going to be the location of our garden. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes, you guys? All right, perfect. I hate speaking on a microphone. Uh, the first thing we need to do is pick a location. I like a location that's going to have plenty of sunlight, at least four hours, because most of these flowers you see here today are going to require four hours or more, okay? We also may want a little bit of shade, and I'll tell you why in a little bit. So, we're going to find our spot in the garden. It doesn't have to be big. It can be small. Uh, mine's not very big. Uh, I've even had people very successful with just container gardening. Uh, I like to put stuff in the ground because it's a lot easier for me to maintain than to remember to water those pots every day, especially come this summer heat. Um, with that said, let's plan on, let's say we're going to plant this guy here. This is a uh, Russian sage. The whole idea is to get this planted and get it planted properly so you have the success in growing these plants. If you do not plant them properly, you are going to fail. You're going to dig your hole twice as wide. So if this is a 10 inch pot, we're going to go twice as wide. Now, do you always have to go twice as wide? You got a 24 inch pot, we're not going to dig a four foot hole. As long as we can get our hands in there, get some fresh dirt in there, pack the soil down, get some water, that's usually enough room. We don't want to plant it any deeper. So it has to be even with the existing soil when we plant it. If you plant it too deep, you're going to kill them. If you plant it too shallow and the root ball sticking above the ground, that's okay. Better high than too deep. So we're going to dig our hole twice as wide and we're going to amend our soil, whether we use mushroom compost, cow compost, organic peat. That's usually our recommendation and when you leave here today, you can ask for planting instructions up at the counter. They'll give them to you. It'll tell you the whole process. So we're going to make a 50-50 mixture with the existing soil. That's going to help retain moisture and nutrient while the roots are getting established. 
And once they get established, then they don't have to rely on us. So we've got our 50-50 mixture. We're adding water into the hole. We're packing the dirt down, making sure we have no air pockets. We get it all covered up. Now we're going to start watering on a normal basis. They're used to getting water every day. So you're going to give them water every day the first week. And that's not an irrigation system. Irrigation's set for two inches. You need to get all the way to the bottom. That would be like somebody spraying a mist bottle in front of your face. Try and drink that. You're gonna, it's not going to be enough. And that doesn't mean go out there and water them at 3 o'clock in the morning after they're already upset, wilting, and not happy. Because guess what? Now they've got to lose weight. That means leaves because they don't have enough moisture to support them. So get out there first thing in the morning. Soak them down. They should last you all day. In the afternoon, maybe you want to check on it. If they're wilting, give them a little splash, and that's it. Not a lot because they don't drink at night. Me and you are not going to sleep in the bathtub all night. And if you do, you're probably not going to be happy the next morning. So don't do it to your plants. Get them watered in in the morning. The second week, you're going to go every other day. Third week, every third day. Fourth week, every fourth day after that. We should be somewhat established, keep an eye on them. Hopefully their roots are down into their own water supply and they're not demanding you every day to go out there and say hi. Okay? So hopefully if anybody have any questions getting them started. You're going to use either mushroom compost, cow compost, peat. Um, there's a lot of different soil amendments, but you want to add something to this sandy soil. If you have hard pan soil, yes, everybody's soil is different. Some of us have hard pan, which I have. That digging that hole twice as wide is going to help with establishing the plant, but you may find that your neighbor's garden took off faster than yours. I'd rather have sand than shell and morrow, because like Dean knows, you got to take a pickaxe, you got to water it down, scrape it, get down in there, and the roots really have a hard time getting moving. So. Expect a little bit longer for them to get established, uh, you know, things like that. Or you better dig a big hole and then just replace all the soil. Or move, one of the two. <laughs> so, you know, if you ever need help with adjusting your soils and stuff like that, let me know. Now, as far as plants go in a pot, you need potting soil, not topsoil, not compost potting soil, something with good aeration, drainage, and just remember if you're growing things in a pot that your environment's going to change over time. Don't let anybody ever tell you that plant needs it once a week, that plant needs it twice a week. There is no way anybody can tell you how much water your plant's going to need. They don't know how much wind you have, they don't know how much sun you have, they don't know how root bound that plant has gotten. And as it becomes root bound, you're going to be watering more and more and more. These things do have a shelf life, so to speak. All right. So I think we got you established. Now let's talk about maintaining the plants. It's going to be pretty easy. They like to eat just like me and you. Usually I recommend using Hollytone. And this is going to be every 90 days or every three months after you're established. So no fertilizer for three, uh, the first month, and then after that, it's every three months. This is an acidic fertilizer. This is going to help your flowering plants flower. Everything that flowers likes more of an acidic soil. Uh, you're on limestone here. It's very alkalinic, so this is going to help with the sulfur in here, lower your pH while they're intaking the nutrients, which is important. This is organic, it's 100% readily available to the plant versus synthetic fertilizer, 20 to 30%. Big bang for your buck. Now we're going to go to threats in your butterfly garden. One, rabbits. Because you may want to plant some of these herbs or some of these nice leafy flowering plants and they're going to want to eat them. 
If they don't, you're lucky. I've got one. He just likes to eat my hibiscus and he touches nothing else. Well, the hibiscus isn't that important to me. He can keep eating. Now, if he starts eating the other plants, uh, he's stew. <laughs> Next one. If you have a lot of wasps around in your area, and I'm not talking bees. Bees are fine. It's the wasps. Okay? Get rid of them. Go in there at night when they're all at their nest and spray the nest down, get rid of them or scrape them off, relocate them if you're brave enough and uh, get rid of them because the mud wasp on your side of your house is going to pick up your caterpillars when they're young and take off. I've seen it. The wasp will eat your caterpillars. If it's too big to run off with, he's going to sit there on the bush and eat it right there. I've got a video on my phone of one doing it. Thankfully, it was just an army worm like a customer had a picture of today. Uh, and he chowed that whole thing down. It's amazing. So get rid of the wasps around there. There are parasitic wasps. We'll go over that a little bit later. This, uh, this one, or the, this is rabbit scram. It's a rabbit repellent, all organic. So if you need to uh, kind of get them away from the garden, train them for a little while, that's what you're going to use to deter them. Guaranteed, too. If it doesn't work, they'll give you your money back. Not your plant, though. <laughs> Ladybugs. I got aphids on my milkweed. I need to get rid of them. What's a natural way that won't hurt my caterpillars? Ladybugs. Guess what ladybugs do? They eat your eggs. So not a good idea to release them. Get out there with your cotton ball, your paintbrush, vacuum, somebody said. If you got one of those dental ones that you can go out there, those work great. Anybody a dentist? Here, I need one. Hopefully, if your plants are healthy, you know, a lot of times your plants can fight off the aphids. They can actually drown them by secreting sap when they're sucking. Now, when you got 10,000 aphids attacking the plant all at once, it can't keep up. So spray them off with a hose lightly. Look at your plants before you do that. Make sure you're not spraying off the eggs. Protect your plants because they, if there's aphids there, the ladybugs are going to come too. So try and keep the aphids off your plants as best as possible. That's why we have these wonderful little cages. You get a bug on your uh, plant, stick it in here, secure it. Nobody can get to it, start being successful. But there's also problems with these two, which we'll get into. So let's identify all our butterflies and their host plant. Now some of you might ask, what's a host plant? Well, that's the plant that they're going to lay their eggs on. That's the plant the caterpillar's going to feed on. That's the plant where it's going to do all its cycles, and then it's going to run off, hang up somewhere, and turn into a crystallis. So this host plant is something that you have to understand is their food source, and you have to feed them. You've just now become a parent. Congratulations. You'll have five babies on this thing and they will devour this. They will get quite large and they will not stop eating until they're done. Was that, Dill? that one was Dill, yep. So first one on the list, one of the most popular ones. We have about 700 different types of butterflies here in the state. United States, I should say. This area has only got a handful, okay? Worldwide, there's over 20,000. And there's quite some interesting ones all around the world. It's really fascinating. I've gone to different places where they have these little pinups of some amazing butterflies. I wish they were here, but hopefully as when I get retired, I can go travel and get to see some of this stuff. So Monarch, first one on the board. One of the longest living butterflies. It's a migratory butterfly and one of the ones that is in trouble. Mexico has very little... Um, laws and regulations on their spring and that is a area where they migrate to so they are killing the numbers of the monarch also the populations so a lot of people have been trying to do their best to help maintain this population and it is actually working 
There's a lot of farms out there that are producing milkweed to use for a cotton substance and a lot of other things. So, uh, kind of cool. There's a lot of different varieties of milkweed. Unfortunately, I don't have any caterpillars right now to show you. Uh, we've just been moving through milkweed so fast that uh, I don't think they have a chance to stick around. That and I got a lot of enemies around here. Um, this is one of the milkweed. I got ton of, tons of them here today. Um, this plant is not going to be your most attractive plant, so don't base it off of that. But we'll go through all these plants. I just want to cover the butterflies and then we'll run through these plants. There's purple milkweed, giant white milkweed. There's all different kinds today. We just have the one variety. Um, so you'll see the first picture up here on the monarch. There's two different ones. One's male and one's female. The way you can identify that is if you look on the back quarter of the wings, the lower quarter there, you'll see on the, on the right side, there's two black dots. That's your male. It's got the male glands there. So that one's milkweed. We'll talk about their favorites and stuff like that. Then you're going to go down to the next one, Viceroy. This one will fool you sometimes, and I've even seen people put pictures in the newspaper and call it a monarch. <laughs> it is not a monarch. It's a look-alike. So the Viceroy, uh, you will see how to identify the difference. Look up at the monarch, you'll see a couple different rings on the band of black. Two, uh, two sets of white spots, okay? That's how you kind of identify them, and they're a little more orangey at times. Then you've got the, uh, that, uh, that one feeds on willows and cottonwoods. Willows are gonna be the ones they're really feeding on in there. Uh, do I have any for sale? No, they're kind of hard to find. So just enjoy them when you get to see them once in a while. They're not a really uh, heavy uh, populated one in this area. Then you got the Buckeye. This one's kind of cool, I like it. It's uh, one of my favorites. Get to see these quite a bit. Uh, and you will see on there, they've got a, a whole bunch of different uh, host plants that they'll lay on. Uh, I've never seen them on our firecracker fern here, but uh, I'm waiting for that day. They must not prefer it over all the other varieties. Um, the next one you're gonna go down to is the Sulfurs. This is a big family. You can get clouded sulfurs, white sulfurs, yellow sulfurs. There's a lot of different types. Um, they mainly feed on the cassias. Which today I've got Bahama cassia and I've got, also got another Cinna cassia. Um, these produce a yellow flower uh, and it's kind of interesting because as this caterpillar feeds on the different plants, parts of the plants, you will find that as it eats the green leaves, the caterpillar's green. As it eats the yellow flowers, it turns yellow. So they hide very well. Typically you don't see them unless you really pay attention. They like the larger leaf varieties of the cassia. Unfortunately, I don't have any large leaf varieties. It's been hard finding cassias over the last few years. Um, but there's popcorn cassia where the flower even smells like popcorn. Uh, I've got seeds for it. Hopefully when I get time this summer, I'll get them in production. So we're gonna flip to the next page. Giant Swallowtail. This one goes on wild lime, Hercules club, or citrus. You'll find them a lot of times on the uh, citrus plants. They've got another name for it. It's called the orange dog. Uh, it's a very unique caterpillar. It looks like bird droppings. Or if you know what lichen is, it looks like lichen on a bark. They blend in very well and they have a very nice defense mechanism. If you're going out there to try it, make sure your stomach is empty or you will not be happy. You tickle its back, it starts to pull out its head out of all this excessive skin that you thought was a head. It wasn't. It was just excessive skin. It comes out, emerges, and puts two antennas up 
and it is the most putrid smell of anything. It, it's terrible. And if some of you customers experienced it years ago, I had one and we put it in a cage and everybody went by and we said, you got to smell this thing. <laughs> put a nice pretty flower in there. That was the wrong flower to put in there too. So kind of, kind of a unique uh, butterfly, very pretty. It's, it's a large one. Uh, and again, you'll find it on your citrus members. If you like, really like them, I can get you the uh, Spanish wild lime. It has got thorns that hook backwards. They are nasty. But if you want to put it by your bedroom window, nobody's coming through that window without you knowing. The next one, we got the tiger swallowtail. You don't see these quite as often, but when you do, you won't miss them. They're bright in color. They're large and pretty. You'll see Sweet Bay Magnolia, which don't do as well here as they do in Orlando further north. Uh, tulip tree, birch tree, cottonwood, and willows again. Um, I wouldn't recommend planting a Sweet Bay Magnolia just because they do survive here. They're just not great trees for this area. They typically struggle. Uh, the other ones, birch and all that, would be possible. Black Swallowtail's your next one. This is the one that gets in your herb garden every time. And it either aggravates you or you eat them or you enjoy them. We get them like crazy here and I'm gonna give away several plants today that either have eggs or caterpillars already on them. Okay? Now some of you probably have bought in dill before and it tasted kind of awkward, smelled awkward. It wasn't dill. It was fennel. And it's, the way to tell is when you're shopping, make sure you're not squishing any eggs, pinch off a little piece. I don't mind. It's the only way to tell sometimes. And smell it. It's either going to smell like dill or it's going to smell like licorice. If it smells like licorice, you got fennel. Now that caterpillar hosts onto parsley, fennel, and dill. Uh, and we've got caterpillars on each today. So if you're out there shopping in my herbs, look closely. There's a lot more out there. Our herbs are uh, organic, done by a grower, so he doesn't spray them with anything. They're safe. Always make sure when you're buying your food source that it is safe. Lowe's and Home Depot are not safe. They are sprayed. I don't care if it's Bonnie's, Bonnie sprays. If it's, uh, unless they have the organic pot, then you can find out whether or not it's been treated with BT. Lowe's, Lowe's same, same thing. Any of your chain stores are buying for prettiness, not for the host plant. So that nice pretty milkweed with tons of flowers and leaves and it looks so pretty, you want to put it in your garden, you plant it, you're not planting it for the monarch, don't realize it, it's sprayed, looks pretty and then it doesn't after a while. Well the growers spray it so it stays pretty. It's not a pretty plant in the landscape. You're going to find that out if you want to do monarchs. So tuck it in behind the bush. All right, next line, let's see. Uh, the zebra, wait, 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 too fast. Polydamus, pipe vine. This one's a little bit, was behind the, uh, it's not the prettiest vine. Okay, this is part of one of the flowers. The reason why these don't look as nice here in the nursery is because we irrigate them. I don't get to choose whether this one gets a gallon or five gallons. Everybody's going to get five gallons and hopefully he survives. Once you get them out of irrigation, they thrive. Um, I've got one out back. It's been going for eight years when we built the garden uh, and it's very prolific. It will get very thick, very full. They'll do a lot of trimming. You'll have a lot of caterpillars, a lot of butterflies very active plant in the garden. It is drought tolerant, absolutely. It should be put on lattice for easier uh, display trimming, but we have it as a ground cover in our garden. So it can be done either way. 
rather it up higher, but you know, it, it still works either way. That's your polydamus. No, there, there is other different types of swallowtails and different types of pipe vines that support different types of them. I'm going to tell you they're not as successful here. Sherry is not here today, but she is planting multiple varieties and they just do not thrive in our climate as well. So I'm only going over the stuff that it does well here so you're successful. Um, next one is going to be your zebra swallowtail. Another one that you're going to find around here but going to have a hard time growing the host plant. It's a pawpaw tree. They're hard to get started. Once you got them going though, they're somewhat easy. But getting them to go is very slow to go and very hard to find. Uh, I think Lucas Nursery in Orlando carries them, but they're not cheap and they have to be just right. Um, your next one is your spice bush swallowtail. Bay tree family, you've got those out in the wild, not as much as we used to. Uh, years ago, beetle came through and wiped out a lot of them. There's spice bush and then the camphor. We got plenty of camphor around. As a matter of fact, I got a tree on the other side of the property. Love the tree. Um, so th then we're going to go on to the next page. Julia. Usually this is not a popular one. We have had an influx of them this year. I've had tons of them uh, in the area this year. So passion vine corky stem. Now I got passion vine here today. They were good caterpillars. They moved. I had another plant but it had fire ants in it. So we saved them really quickly. So I got a couple caterpillars on here. This is not the corky stem passion vine. I've been having a hard time finding that one lately, but um, that's the one that the Julia likes to lay on. Golf fertilary, that's what we have here today. They'll lay on every passion vine that they can when they're desperate. They'll even lay them on the red, which does not support the caterpillar. You need to have the blues, the purples, or even the really, really tiny little uh, flowering variety that has no color really to it at all. Um, Golf fertilary, probably the most, uh, the one you're going to see the most. They're highly active, very fast flying butterfly. Very popular here. Your next one, you guys should know this if you're living in Florida. And usually I have one always flying around here during the seminar, but they've been a little slow this year. Zebra longwing, very neat uh, caterpillar. It's usually white with some black spikes coming off of it. Um, very pretty, uh, floats around. That is your state butterfly. That one goes into the uh, maypop, which we got a bunch of here today. So if you want to try and attract that one, Remember how I told you you need a little bit of shade sometimes in your garden? This is one that likes to lay its eggs in the shade, fly in the shade. So, may pop or uh, the, uh, the may pop, this one here. Yep, and I've got, I've got some, several of them in our uh, vine section. They've got a smaller flower on them and you'll notice that. Um, and they're kind of a bluish rather than that big beautiful purple one that I have sitting over there with fire ants in it. So make sure you stick to the blues, not the reds. The, the reds are just, they're pretty. My mother-in-law has them, grow prolific, attracts a ton of butterflies. So if you don't like having your stuff eaten up and you just want to see the butterflies come and go, that's a good one. Next one is your queen. This one uh, feeds on your milkweed. Don't let it confuse you. The way you're going to tell between the monarch and the queen when they're caterpillars is that they're going to have an extra antenna. They're going to have three instead of two on their head. Okay? They look the same. And I'm going to tell you a couple little interesting things between the, the, uh, between the monarch, the queen, and the... Uh, one of the swallowtails that get on the parsley and fennel. 
I already told you the mechanism of one of the swallowtails, putting out the antennas. Smell. Your monarch eats this milkweed because it has latex in it. It's poisonous. So if it gets eaten by something, that bird more than likely, like the mockingbird that's in my tree driving me crazy right now, <laughs> they eat that so that they're poisonous. Now the swallowtail that gets on your uh, herbs looks kind of like the monarch caterpillar. So that way it kind of disguises itself so it doesn't want to get eaten. And the queen obviously has the poison in her as well. Next one. This one has become kind of a, an, an interest to most people. And um, I've got a little extra uh, insight on it by a family member last year. The Atala butterfly, which is the Kunti palm. A very slow growing native cycad to Florida. Back in the 1950s when the wars were going on, the Indians decided they were going to show the white man how to make a starch out of this. Well, all the soldiers getting gassed in the wars, needing something easy to eat on their stomach, needing something cheap and easy, this was free. It was grown out in the woods, native. They decided to start harvesting it. They over-harvested it. Almost killed off the population of the Atala. Back in the 1950s, it was thought to be extinct. Okay? There have been sightings as far as Melbourne now. Maybe even further that I don't know of. But uh, my cousin in downtown Melbourne has several pictures of these. Um, we, we've sighted them here in Vero. I mean, I could tell you stories all day, but one of their favorite flowers for nectar is this sweet almond. So that's always a good one to put in there. Uh, it's got a wonderful smell. Then I put the malachite in here. I've never seen one. They're more to, uh, further south. Uh, someday I hope to see one, but I had a friend that's just in love with butterflies and uh, thought maybe he'd make it here one day, so I threw it on there just to make him happy. So I had to take a picture of it and send it to him, I guess. But uh, green shrimp plant, if you got it, you probably won't get rid of it because it's a little invasive sometimes. Now back on here, I could go all day about talking about different parasites and different things. This is why it is important to still have some kind of sense of either urgency, cleanliness, different things like that. So your first one on here, this is... If you're raising butterflies, it can be very frustrating. And a lot of times we get fingers pointed at us. You killed my butterflies. You killed my caterpillars because you gave me tainted milkweed. Has there been situations? Yes. Do I know when it happens? Oh, yes. I get to see it happen here. I get 100 customers calling me. What in the world? Don't do it again. The growers that we get them from, our friends and family. Have I had to outsource to new customers, to new vendors? Yes. Will I do it anymore? No. If it's not, if I don't know the people, I'm not going to listen to that salesman because that salesman is just trying to make money. So we try and make sure that we get it from reputable companies. If you're not sure and you're curious and want to know, ask the guys. They'll either say yes or we don't know. Ten, uh, so you got these flies that attack your, your, your monarchs. So w watch for those. They look like regular old flies. Sometimes it's very hard to tell the difference. And you can read up on this article, but I'm not really going to go into too much detail with this stuff because it's, I got to get onto the plane to move through here, but you can read up on it. I am, however, going to touch up on the next one. This was great. I had a customer come in today with a box with a monarch sitting in it and the wings are folded over and she can't get them all the way open. It's called OE. I'm not going to try and pronounce that whole name because I'll never get it out. All right. So as you read, it'll tell you it's a parasite. What has happened is that caterpillar has ingested a parasite. 
So it is important if you're really into it and want to keep the numbers as high as possible that you wash those leaves off, clean them off. I can't control everything in this environment. I wish I could. That's why you guys got to do a little extra work. And it's not like we do it on purpose. It's going to happen. It's mother nature. There's no 100%, no dummy proof systems. Uh, but basically, it gets an infection, gets weak, and can't open the wings all the way. Now what do we do? We can feed it, have a pet in the house for a week or however long she decides she can live. Some people will feed them Gatorade, sugar water, or just go out there and get some nice flowers for them that uh, preferably are not sprayed. I don't do any spraying on the property more, anymore as of last year. Uh, I've got beehives here. They're good bees and I plan to keep them. So if I got bugs on my plants, I'm sorry. I can help you control them in any way that you need to, but we're going organic here. Nuclear uh, polyheterosis virus, another virus, you know, they're just like us. We can get sick, we got cancers, we got parasites. Uh, then you got bacterial diseases. Remember when I told you you got to be careful just because you put them in a cage doesn't mean now you don't have to worry about them anymore. If you don't clean that cage on a normal basis and you got a lot of frat sitting in there, which is the droppings, frass, it's, uh, they'll get sick too. So cleanliness is important. Use a 50-50 bleach and water mix when the caterpillars aren't in there. Take them out, put them on a plant, and get it cleaned up. Let it dry, get them back out there. Tainted milkweed. Kind of covered that already. Don't spray it. There's no spray you can use to keep the aphids off. It's not going to happen. Okay? Wasp. Here we go again. There's different types of wasp. You'll see there's more than one on the list. There's one that'll lay its eggs on the outside of the caterpillar. I've seen it happen. Thankfully, it was an army worm and not a, a, a one of uh, that we prefer. I mean, I could have probably taken the eggs off, but nah, does the wasp have a duty to do here too? Yes, he's a pollinator of something. So I'll let him be on that caterpillar. He gets to eat that day. Um, so make sure you keep that together. The uh, anal prolapse, yeah, it's kind of doomsday on that one. No cure, no, no really, uh, nothing you can do about that one. Dehydration. If you got them sitting in here eating leaves, most of their hydration is going to come from that. We should be okay, but if you set that caterpillar down by the AC return of your house and you dry the plant out, dry the caterpillar out, they're going to die. You know, once in a while, we should have enough humidity here, but if you need to and you really got the AC cut down low and it's a dry place, you might want to just mist it once in a while. Don't keep excessive water in there, okay, because that's no good too. Visible predators, spiders, lizards, fire ants, wasps. You know, there's, there's a lot of uh, predators, so keep an eye for those. And then there's BT, caterpillar spray. That's a spray a lot of these growers use, especially on their herbs and different things to keep the caterpillars at bay. Uh, or any chewing insect because it is uh, cheap and very successful for them to control. So you have to watch for that. Um, just because it's organic doesn't mean it's safe. Does anybody have any questions about the caterpillars that I need to go over? Can I mention something? I saw the Atala at the library at West Palm Beach, and they have loads of coon tea palm growing there, and it's very easy to find it. Yeah, nice. Then the other place you can get the malachite, which I saw, is at Lake Okeechobee. Lake there, Okeechobee? There's a butterfly center. In fact, from the air, it's in the form of a butterfly, and they, they're they eating, or they're on the, uh, the decaying, either the decaying items underneath the fig trees, but you can find them there. Wow, But cool. you can call and find out when, when they would be there. All right, 
All right, well, there's a butterfly place out in Okeechobee is what she's saying, that you can actually go out, see the malachite and a lot of other things. Uh, I'm sure you can Google them, uh, the Atala, West Palm, but we've also got a lot of uh, uh, Atalas here locally. If you go to the ELC here or even uh, Sea Oaks, they have had major hatch outs because they have so many Kuntis. Uh, the Atala back two years ago when Rule was still alive, came in for poison for his Kuntis, and I went, whoa, 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 no, no. We had an article in the paper, I have sent it off to a lot of different people, and, you know, and then it finally made its way north, so we're getting a good population. Sorry. Everybody talks about how to keep the cages clean. What if you're not growing in cages? What are you growing in your yard? How do you... If you're growing in your yard, I mean, there's really not much you can do. I mean you don't have a sterile environment so you're gonna have the luck of the draw basically you know it one out of a hundred caterpillars probably makes it through its adult stage so even though you're saving a lot as soon as you let it go who knows if it's gonna get hit by a car uh, you know a bird snatching it so you know you try to do the best you can keep the plants as healthy as possible the plants will fight off their own fungus and in turn help with the caterpillars being as healthy and nutritional as possible, okay? Okay, and the next one is talking to the native plant people. The OE is being a big problem with the tropical milkweed yeah. as opposed to the natives. Right. Tropical milkweed, native milkweed, the OE disease is more popular in some of them. Yes, the reason being the growers. The growers grow this stuff. If there's any, uh, any kind of disease going around, it multiplies. It splashes on the ground, splashes back up at the plants. Um, you know, that's, it's mother nature. We can't control 100% as much as we'd love to. Um, I'm gonna go through these plants real quick, give you some ideas of their favorites, and then I'll let you guys get out of here. We'll do some prizes. firebush these are kind of a must you got them in all different flavors from three feet all the way up to 12 feet your firefly being the smallest that's your true dwarf they say keep it around three feet I've seen it upwards to six then your dwarf variety is going to get upwards to six to eight not really a dwarf your regular is going to go upwards to 12 they also like hummingbirds Works as a great hedge. Firebush. Salt tolerance, I can do them my best. Not every day am I planting on beach side, but um, yeah. <coughs> the firebush is gonna be all kinds. It's gonna be all kinds. You're, you're very high nectar, a lot of volume of flowers, a lot of different butterflies are gonna feed off of it. It is a very, uh, it's one of the ones you should have in there. It's a recommended to have. Yes. Someone said there was a net, uh, uh, two types of firebush. One was native and one was a hybrid. There is. Yeah. And it's going to do the hybrids or something? It, it really, no, it doesn't really matter. I've seen them all. Um, it's a familiar flower. Yes. Yes, the firebush is salt tolerant. It can handle the beach. Um, I'm just gonna just um, we'll go th we'll go through them, and I'll try and try and tell you from what I've observed, and then um, you know if there's questions at the end, we'll definitely handle them. That firebush does it need a lot of water? I have a lot that I'm trying to get rid of grass. I'm too cheap to put. None of these plants require you to water them on a daily basis, okay, or weekly basis. It's getting them started. Once you've got them started, there's no water required after if you've done it properly. I have no irrigation in my yard, and I have a pretty butterfly garden. I've got a lot of other plants. So get them established properly and feed them when they need it. 
All right, I'm going to try and keep going through this because I know other people got things to do today. We've got a blue butterfly clerodendron. This attracts, this is another one that is just a nectar plant. It's a little bit different color. You're going to see that there's going to be a lot of reds and oranges in the garden. So if you want to soften up the reds and oranges, you got blue butterfly clerodendron. This will grow upwards six, eight feet if you let it. Most people will keep it around the four foot range. Flowers year round. All these plants I'm showing you are going to be year round plants, year round flowering. I'm going to give you another purple one or lavender or blue. Uh, this one produces a lot of flower. You can find this in tree form, bush form. This is Duranta Sapphire Shower, also known as Golden Dew Drop. It'll produce a lot of little yellow berries. Cut the yellow berries off, it'll reflower a lot faster for you. This is a fast grower. Your fire bush is a fast grower. Could you repeat the names of these plants? <laughs> Duranta Sapphire Shower. If you say Sapphire Shower, they're going to know what you're talking about. You got Cape Honeysuckle. This is another good one, especially for the butterflies that have a long spout that like to get their nose way down in there. Your butterflies will do a lot of tasting by their feet. That's where their senses are. That's Cape Honeysuckle. And as far as the salt tolerance on that one, that's a good one. You can't handle the salt on that one. The blue butterfly I would not recommend over by the beach. Now this firecracker fern, this was one of the hosts. Uh, that was for the buckeye. This one can grow upwards four foot or so. You can cut it right back down to the ground when it gets too big. Also comes in yellow. Highly drought tolerant, so if you're looking for a potted plant, they're real pretty in pots. They'll get tall and they'll also cascade. Uh, also another hummingbird lover. So if you want to incorporate that, you can. This one here is the sweet almond. If you guys like a little fragrance in the garden, something sweet to smell, maybe you like to just crack the flower off and throw it in the vacuum or something, help cover up that dust smell, this is a good one. Uh, it's not as potent as a gardenia, but it, it is very sweet smelling and it's one of the Atala's favorite to feed on. So far from what my cousin says and a few others, the Atala's prefer a white flower, which is kind of uh, unusual for butterflies because they see reds and oranges a lot better and further away. That one's going to get upwards four foot, six foot. It's not always the prettiest bush, but it does smell great. As far as salt tolerance, I'm sorry I can't tell you that on that one. Um, Cassias, it's a big range of um, family. These can grow anywhere from four foot upwards to 15, 20 feet. Okay, they can be used as a tree or a bush or maybe a multi-trunk bush standard, however you want to do it. Uh, again, there's a lot of varieties out there. Uh, popcorn uh, is one of them. There's candlestick, which is your native cassia. And then you've got Bahama Cassia, Mexican. Uh, this is a Mexican variety, even though they call it uh, Bahama. I don't know why. I still got to do research. I just finally got this for the first time. You've got the Cinna Cassia. Again, that's your host plant for the sulfurs. I told you about the milkweed. Um, Cassias are semi, so if you're not oceanfront, you would be okay with your cassia. Milkweed, there's a lot of different varieties of this. The lady mentioned that the uh, non-native varieties sometimes uh, create more issues, but they're the ones that we can find the most, and they are laying and eating and being successful on it, but you may want to go in there, clean your leaves off, especially if they're an older crop. The newer they are, usually the cleaner they are, the healthier they are. Once the fertilizer starts lacking from the growers, when do we get into troubles, usually? 
that is not your focal point. They will get leggy, go in there, trim them down when they get too tall, or let them go until they seed, and you will find that there is a ton of seed in there. Or start replanting your own. You might save some money. One plant is never enough. <laughs> now you may find on your milkweed you also get this pesky little black bug with red or orange striping on it. Squish them. Get rid of them. They're not good for your plant. They sting the plant. They ruin the plant. They discourage uh, your butterflies. Okay? I don't want to land and lay my babies on a plant that's full of bugs that I'm not too interested in them being around. Those are strangers. It is poisonous. It's poisonous to anybody and everybody that's allergic to latex. It contains latex. People say if my dog eats oleander, it's going to die or eats milkweed. Not necessarily. I, got a, I had a Dotson Beagle. It, it doesn't matter what he ate. Nothing killed that dog. Now, did he throw up all over my house? Oh, yes. Yeah. Teach them not to eat the leaves is better. Native, yes? Native milkweed does best east-facing, south-facing, or any different? Um, not that I know of. They're typically the more sun, the better on them. Uh, again, guys, it, please, if I can, just have you hold your questions, and then you can come up to me all after. And If anything I miss, please, I, I don't mind. This one here is Russian sage. This is probably one of the hardest plants for me to find, but I do enjoy it for its looks and its uniqueness. Uh, I do have a bunch of these in stock at the moment. They're best kept around two to three feet. Uh, pretty easy grower, drought tolerant for sure. Uh, nice purple flower with kind of a softer silvery uh, foliage. Um, salt tolerance I would think is more moderate. And again, these are, these are uh, at least four hours or more is uh, recommended. Fennel, fennel is probably going to be your longest lasting for, as far as the herbs go, feeding your caterpillars. You can cut it back, it'll get very bulbous, it'll get large over the years, and continue to re-giving and giving and giving. When dill goes to bolt or seed, it's done. You got to get a new plant, so feeding dill can get a little expensive, whereas fennel can rejuvenate. Same thing with parsley. They get tired, you're usually out of luck. Budleia, probably one of my favorites, but one that you do have to replace after so long. I was educated by a customer here that is in, uh, in the, his family's in the business, and uh, hopefully maybe someday I can have him join the team. But uh, Bud Leia, one of our favorites in the garden, uh, wonderful scent to it. Uh, it's also known as butterfly bush, and there's a lot of different varieties, so ask us according to what variety you want. This light purple one's a dwarf variety, doesn't get as large, maybe three, four feet. This variety here with the dark purple, very prolific, the butterflies love it. E if you smell it, you know why the butterflies like it. I don't have to tell you. It is heavenly. What is it called? Budleia or butterfly bush. Semi-salt tolerance. Uh, the catch with this one is the nematodes like it, so you're only going to get maybe three years or so out of it, according to the, my, the, the guy, uh, Brett. So... You know, I, I don't know. I just put in my garden so far, mine's thriving. If it is susceptible to nematodes, I'm not going to expect it to live long, but you better bet my, you better bet that I'm going to replant it again because I got to have it in there. Very high activity in the nursery. I was watching it right before the class. You know, I've got some skippers skipping on there, feeding off the nectar. I've got the golf artillery out there and then comes by a sulfur, you know, so Lots, lots of activity on these guys. Uh, lots of nectar. Salvia. This one here. Uh, there's a huge variety of salvia. It comes in all different colors, flavors. Make sure you ask the local guys if it's a year-round or not, because there's a lot of annual versions. 
This is Mist Expires, one of my favorites. Will grow year in and year out, flowers all year. Gets up around two to three feet. Uh, you can cut it back, very easy grower. Or it'll suck up some water too. That one I believe will be damaged by salt. Passion vine, we went over that one I think pretty uh, extensively, so grows fast. And it is a very uh, productive one as far as caterpillars, so if you got kids or you always want to see something moving, going on, passion vine is going to bring you a lot of activity, whether it's just for nectar or actually hosts. My next door neighbor growing up as a kid grew this through his clumping bamboo, which sat right on top of his septic tank, obviously. What? The septic tank worked perfect. They had slat house too, so the boards ran horizontally, and man, the cocoons, the chrysalis would just load up on that thing. Perfect scenario. Porterweed, probably another must. Uh, very prolific. There are native varieties here. Um, there's a dwarf variety that's red. It's a little more, uh, it's a little harder to grow. Can handle some salt. Uh, these grow upwards to five feet, some of these varieties. Don't be scared to cut them back. The more you cut them back, the bushier, the thicker they get. They will get really thick and full. Porterweed. Here's your red door variety. <laughs> you smell that, I'm going to start talking about it. See what you smell. You can't. Did I grab the wrong variety? I don't know anything about plants. Either that or raw duds. <laughs> oh, that one smells. It just wasn't ripe. You picked the wrong flower. Do you smell it? Yeah, it smells familiar. <laughs> all right, these are all gone for any of They're smelling it. They're not sure what it is. You go up there, it's called Gomphrenia. There's a lot of different varieties, but this one here, if you go up on the benches, there's some really tall, wild ones. It smells like celery. No? Uh, yeah. Soup. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Celery stock or something. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah now I have y'all smelling <laughs> flowers up there. The guys are gonna be going, hey, people are weird. So these are really wild. They can get upwards to three feet. They're kind of neat sticking behind other shorter things because they pop up, get kind of wild, lots of flowers. The butterflies like it because it's a lot of quick nectar. Uh, Gomphrenia, G-O-M-P-H. Uh, I'm going to leave it at that. Gomphrenia comes in a lot of flavors, really fun, very easy to grow. Uh, the guy that we buy it from, I mean, he's just ecstatic at how well it grows in his garden. So, very pretty plant. Gallardia, if you guys like natives, you're out of luck because I can't get the native variety of this. They did it for a reason, so when you're asking for natives, just because it says it's a native on my sign, no. There's just guidelines on my sign. Once in a while I come across the native, but the native is not as pretty as the ones they've hybridized. They hybridize them for two reasons. One, to make them look pretty. Two, the reason why they hybridize this one is so it doesn't grow everywhere in your yard. That one's going to be a low growing one. Oh, about a foot, two feet tall, salt tolerant for sure. You can go up to the uh, Titusville Wildlife Refuge, go out there on your way to Hallover Canal to go fishing. Certain times of the year, you can see it's just a, a, a blanket of flowers, and that's its other name, blanket flower. And they do, they load up. This one here, this is one of your musts in the garden. 
Oh, they did pick me the right color. Red is good. Why is red so good? Because they see it better, farther away. Something they're familiar with. Your eyes can see it better too. So pintas are a high cluster of flower, definitely a favorite. If you get here first thing in the morning, you will see lots of activity on this plant. Lots of activity on this plant. Come in a wide variety of flavors. We carry a lot of the dwarf varieties that only get about a foot and a half to two feet tall. If you want the regular varieties, you can order them. They'll go upwards to four foot. White, pinks, purples, you name it. Then you can get into Panama Rose. This is in the Pinta family, but this is one that'll grow uh, four, five, six feet tall, flowers year round. Panama Rose, another good one. All right, another favorite you must have. And I can tell you this one, just as well as the pintas and the firebush, if you don't have this one in your yard, you're missing out. Because it is, there's a lot of native uh, lantana out in the wild. It's something that the butterflies are familiar with, and they love this plant. You will get all kinds of different activity on this plant, okay? Lantana comes in a lot of varieties. This is a bigger leaf variety. The big leaves are an upright growing bush form. If you see the little tiny leaf ones, usually in white, yellow, or purple, that is a ground cover lantana, okay? Uh, we carry a wide variety of them. Must have in your butterfly garden. You must have that one. It, it's, the bush forms can be anywhere from two foot up to six foot, depending on variety. Most of them are going to be shorter nowadays, but if you get the native, it's going to get large. Um, great plant, though, really. Here's your normal big fire bush. You'll get birds in here, too, because they like to gobble up the seeds. Hummingbirds love them. Powder puff's a good one for hummingbirds, too. Powder puff. Yeah, it kind of looks like mimosa, so they get used to seeing that while they're flying down. Shrimp plant, another butterfly. Uh, if you can get the green shrimp plant, that is uh, the host plant for, I believe, the malachite. Unless I got it confused. Yeah, green flower. They've got white ones. They've got yellow. They've got red. They've got one that's called cocktail. Pours out gin, vodka, and whiskey. <laughs> Cigar plant, and you can see these, these, these plants have some kind of structure to them. They either have a tubular small flower or they have a wide open flower where they can collect a lot of nectar. They're quick, easy, multiple flowers. Um, this one here is called the cigar plant. I sold this to a customer years ago when I first started here. The guys told me that uh, you make cigars out of it. I sold it to the guy trying to be a salesman, do my job. And I've uh, never seen a guy since. <laughs> it does not make cigars. Not even close. Powder puff can get extremely huge. They can get up 20 feet if you let them. Uh, there are dwarf varieties, and we carry them that only get about four to six foot. This one here is coneflower, also known as echinacea, another good one. Uh, some people uh, really love it and some people hate it. Likes it on the drier side. So if you're getting too wet, you're going to notice it's not happy. This one's going to get upwards a foot and a half or so. Lots of different colors. This one here is bat face. This one can grow in a little bit of shade, can also take the sun. It's going to get upwards to about a foot and a half to two feet. Flowers year round, pretty easy grower. Uh, don't be scared to trim it because it can get a little wild. Bat face, it's in the Kufia family. Coreopsis, this comes in a lot of native forms and non-native forms. Uh, you probably see them growing on the side of the road, little yellow uh, daisy with a little black center to it, kind of wispy. Uh, 
This is a different variety, obviously, than your native, but uh, another good one that's very drought tolerant, can handle some salt, uh, low growing. So if you need something short, great, about a foot high. Guara, kind of like your gonfrenia, more of that wild look. You can plant it behind something and get these nice light flowers popping up that look like little butterflies. Uh, or orchid flowers. Uh, they also have a red foliage with a pink or reddish flower that's real pretty up there. Uh, another great one. That's Guara. Yep. This one's a new one for us. I'm not sure how well it's going to do through the summer, but this is supposed to be a the heat tolerant marguerite daisy a perennial here for florida it's first time this year so we're going to try it and hopefully it withstands the heat because if it's like its cousin they don't like the heat so much and they like lots of water uh, i do not believe this is salt tolerant by any means the kunti palm i know i kind of told you it was a host plant but this thing is slow growing, okay? So if you ever want to see Kunti palms large, you might want to buy them larger or get them planted now and get growing because it takes a lot to make a nice plant. Uh, Kunti palm gets about three feet uh, at its max. Uh, ours in the back stays even lower and kind of hugs the ground a little bit, but uh, once they get going, they thrive. Very easy grower as long as it's on the dry side. If you got moisture, forget about it. The Atala. Salt tolerant. You got Diamond Frost. Another one that they can collect a little quick nectar. This is more for your skippers. The butterflies, not as much, but if you like those little fast guys that buzz in and out real quick, you'll get them to stop on here for a little bit. Diamond frost grows about a foot and a half, and then it'll flare down the edge of a pot if you put it in the pot, or it'll continue to kind of fluff out and come up. A uh, very hardy plant. This one here is probably one of my favorites that I've been working with in the gardens because it is tough. We talked about that shell and marrow. This baby can handle it. Out of my uh, garden, this one is just going crazy. Um, Thryalis is the name. It's got a yellow flower. It's year round. Uh, it is a little tender. Uh, so if you get a frost on it, it might burn it back, but you can trim it right back. It blows right back up. I've got it in Palm Bay. Thryalis. Yep. T H. R-Y, she's going to sell it, spell it for me, A-L-S, L-L-I-S, try Alice, yep, you got your A in there, what's that, I haven't missed it yet, I'm just, uh, you know, I get, that was my favorite, okay, you what, this one, that's the Pinta, this is a new variety that we started carrying. It's actually been out for a couple years, but I went ahead and grabbed some for this weekend. This is a star cluster variety. They get a larger flower, but still don't grow quite as tall as the normal, but not as low as the door. So about two, two and a half feet, bigger flower, uh, more prolific, very pretty plant. Cat whiskers. Another great one for the garden. They come in lavender as well. Kind of looks like cat whiskers. Gets about three feet tall. Pretty rapid growth, pretty rugged. If it gets hit by the frost, trim it back. It'll grow back. Sestrum. Don't always get to see this one too often. I got a grower that does it every couple of years. Uh, good for hummingbirds, good for butterflies, has some salt tolerance, drought tolerance, uh, grows upwards to four to five feet. Very easy grower. What's the name of that one again? 
Sestrum with a C. And then you got your trophy. This is a great one in either tree form or bush form. Flowers red year round, gets a lot of action with the butterflies, another good one to have in there. This is one of our focal points in our butterfly garden out back. Uh, they can get upwards to 15 feet or you can keep them as low as three feet. Uh, very hardy, can handle salt, uh, year-round bloomer, you can grow them into a hedge, you name it. Jatropha. There's a lot of different types of Jatropha out there, that's the one you want. Then we got Vitex, these are getting ready to go into full bloom. Another great one, you can kind of see it's similar to the Bud Leia, or, uh, Bud Leia or butterfly bush uh, flowers. Great for nectar, they do make a native form of this, however this one is not it. Uh, but another great nectar uh, plant, this one can get upwards of six foot. Uh, year round bloomer, pretty tough. Again, if it gets nipped in the cold weather, trim it back, it'll pop up. Moderately salt tolerant. Vitex. Vitex. There's a lot of different varieties. All right, well, that's a, that's a few of the plants anyways. If you walk around the nursery, you'll find that our signs have a butterfly on them. That either means it's an attractor or a host, and you will find that underneath the butterfly it'll say host or attractor. Um, so that'll give you some uh, little guidelines when you're walking around here. Most of my annuals are gone at the moment, so most of the stuff that you see out here on the benches will go year round. Just keep in mind, if you're outside of the two buildings, it's sun. If you go into the buildings, it's shade. You're going to find that most of this stuff I told you today is all sun. Your shrimp plant can handle a little shade, your passion vine, some of these things can handle a little bit, but if you put them in too much shade, your flower production is going to go down. So more sun is better? More sun is better. All right, I'm going to open up for questions just for a few minutes, and then uh, I'll let you guys get out of here. We'll do some prizes.